Welcome everybody to uh, this month's edition of Arizona PowerShell uh, Users Group. Today we uh, um, have some distinguished guests. Uh, our speaker, Don Jones. That's on the camera. That's on the camera. You want on the That's camera? on the camera, Jeff. <coughs> oh, is it on the camera? Yeah, it's live streaming to the entire universe. Well, that's okay. <laughs> not a big deal. It's not like it's a huge. <laughs> okay. So. Um, you just also write your credentials and <laughs> just log in as Jeff. <laughs> nice. So Jeff, you wanted to take a few minutes and let everybody know <coughs> the layout of the place and whatnot. Sure, thank you. Uh, welcome to Interface, and uh, glad to have everybody here. Glad to see Don again. It's been a while. Don used to teach here quite a bit, and of course Jason uh, taught here for a long time as well. So it's great to have everybody come back and see everybody. Um, we. Um, we're a training company here in Phoenix, and uh, we have uh, quite a few classes. We do PowerShell. Jason Yoder, there you are, teaching our PowerShell class this week. And um, Jason. Yeah. Yay, there he is. So uh, love to uh, see all of you come out here and, uh, and uh, take classes if you're, if you're interested in it. We do a full range of uh, Microsoft, Cisco, um, ITEL, uh, project management, all kinds of classes. So uh, for the facility here, obviously most people know where the food is. Uh, but if you want to go out to the restroom, just go out the doors to your left, take your first right across from the bank of phones, and you'll see the restrooms there. Um, we'll be uh, around if you have any other questions, and I will just let you take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I would like to offer a, a huge thanks to Justin, our, our sponsor from Tech Systems. So Justin, if you have just a minute, um, I'll give you a floor for a couple minutes, and then we'll turn it over to our, to our speaker. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Yep. So I'll keep it pretty brief here. Uh, hope you guys are enjoying the food. Um, just pull real quick. Pizza or pita jungle for like next time? What's what's the preference? Pita jungle. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah, cool. That was good. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, well, I think I've met like most of you guys before. I've been to several of these events with Tom here. So I'm Justin Golner. I'm a lead recruiter with Tech Systems. So I'll be here with one of my partners probably each time. Make sure that we bring some pita jungle for you guys, um, and then. I'll also talk about uh, like the market, any current positions we have. So I do all my recruiting on the Microsoft side of things. So Windows Server, um, SQL, anything like that. Um, so I'll talk briefly about positions each meeting. Um, we'll just have one right now, um, uh, kind of a mid-level SQL DBA for one of our customers. So if you guys would like more details, definitely feel free to contact me back there. I'll leave a few of my business cards as well too with Tom, because I have to leave probably around 6.30, 6.45 this afternoon. Um, but uh, that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions during breaks or, or just really want to know more about the market, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I'll see you guys at every meeting. Thank you. Okay, and I guess I need to go sit down and color because we'll turn over the floor to floor <laughs> Mr. Jones here. Thanks, Mr. Jones. I didn't know we had to have breaks. I didn't know we did either. I was going to be that. <laughs> okay, well, I'll take a break if the time seems right then. Jason, time me. If I go over 12 hours, let's take a break. Okay. Right? I'll do that. Um, thanks for having me out. It's kind of, it's, there's a lot of you that I've, I've met before. Uh, it's been about a year and a half, two years since I was, I was out in Phoenix. Uh, so it's kind of good to see uh, familiar faces again. Thanks for coming out. I wanted to uh, just kind of give you a little update tonight. I, I didn't want to do a big tech demo. Um, you know, it's, it's so easy with that YouTube thing to just go watch somebody spew off a little tech demo. Um, obviously. It'd be nice if you used Pluralsight or you know, came and got some real training from someone instead of using YouTube to run your entire career, but hey, it's your career. I thought instead tonight I would kind of give you some ideas of where to point that career, very specific to the field of PowerShell and desired state configuration, because it's a, it's a huge fluxy space. Um, I mean, everybody knows the product cycles are getting shorter, right? You know, Microsoft shipping new product. This, this particular technology, DSC, they're shipping new product like every 12 hours. It, it's really fast moving. Uh, and so I thought I'd just kind of let you know what the state of DSC is. Uh, and then Jason's been actually digging a lot into the tech, so we can get really kind of deep and gnarly to, you know, if, if you want to dig into those details. But a little bit of background, I guess, and, and, some, and some look back. How many of you have played with DSC at all? Okay, just a few. How many of you have played with PowerShell at all? Okay, that's better. Thanks for at least being there with us. So when Jeffrey Snover back in, it was 2002 or so, that he wrote a document called the Monad Manifesto, and it was kind of a description of what he thought Microsoft needed to do at the time 
to pull itself out of this world of clicking next, next, finish, and bring actual automation to the world of, of Windows administration. And at the time, VBScript was our automation language. Anybody play with VBScript? How'd that work out? <laughs> I wrote a book and, and you know, made a couple mortgage payments off that book over the course of several years. So, I mean, VBScript was, was relatively good to me, but it would always just kind of let you down at the end, right? You, you could get to a certain point and then you just could not go any further and, and you had to go back to next, next, finish. So he wrote this document and it really broke down four phases of what he thought Microsoft needed to do. And the first phase was to create a consistent composable command line language structure that all of Microsoft and other people could contribute to so that we could do everything we needed from the command line, right? Because the first step is you got to be able to do stuff from text because you can automate that, right? You can put text into a file and then tell the computer to run it. You can call it a program or a script or whatever, but that's what it is, it's text. That was PowerShell version one. That's what they shipped. And he said, the next thing we need to do is make sure that one person sitting on one machine can tell a thousand or 10,000 other machines what to do. And it needs to be arbitrary, like everything you could possibly do needs to be remote, right? We got to be able to sit in one spot and manage all of our computers. And that was what they shipped with PowerShell version two, it was PowerShell remote. And he said, the next thing we need to be able to do is have long running processes that might need to survive a network outage or might need to reboot the computer. And they need to remember where they left off and be able to pick it back up and continue. And that's what they sort of kind of shipped as workflow in PowerShell version three. Um, I disagree with Jeffrey on how successful of an implementation they actually did, but let's just say they did it and move on. And the last thing he wrote in the manifesto was, now that we've got all those commands, we've got all those things that can manage everything, and they've got the ability to run against remote computers, and they've got the ability to have their process interrupted and they can remember where they were and pick up and come back, now we need the ability to write, and this is phase four, to write a document that says, this is what the computer ought to look like. Figure it out. And that's what they shipped in PowerShell version four with desired state configuration. So how many of you have used, first of all, I guess, we should back up, I don't wanna make assumptions. How many of you have Active Directory? You, oh, okay, so that got around. <laughs> what about group policy? Okay, desired state configuration really is not a new idea. It's the same idea as group policy. Here's a bunch of check boxes and drop down boxes with what I want the computer to look like. And I don't know how it's going to happen. A miracle is going to occur, but it will make it look like that. The difference is group policy is very, very limited. It can only do a few things. The base, base group policy is, is really just registry hacks, right? It comes from a technology that was developed for Windows 95 called system preferences. And then they've added some, bolted some things onto it and all that. So desired state configuration was intended to be a wide open field where if you could do it with PowerShell, you could do it with DSC, and you no longer need to tol tell the computer what to do. Right? This is the big shift with DSC. How many of you have ever written a script to provision a computer? Pain in the neck, right? Why is it a pain in the neck? Because you test it, and then on line 500 of 600, it breaks. And you can't just run it again because you can't have those first 500 things happening, right? Join the domain. Boom, I'm already a member of the domain. Crap. So you have to start all over with the entire thing. They're very delicate. So this idea of telling the computer what to do is not efficient. The idea behind DSC is you tell the computer what to be. You describe the end state and you let the computer figure it out. You need to be in the domain. Well, yeah, duh, I already am. Okay, next. And it just works through that whole process. And that's what DSC does. And honestly, what they shipped with version four did that. And it, it did it pretty well. Now, it lacked any kind of tooling whatsoever, right? So your description of what the computer is supposed to look like is just a giant text file, uh, a fairly hard to read text file at that. It's a MOF file, a managed object format, a MOF file. And you could produce that MOF from a special kind of PowerShell script called a configuration script, which doesn't actually need to contain any programming. Um, it, like, if you get yourself a couple extra curly bracket keys on your keyboard, you can knock one out with no programming at all. It's mostly curly brackets. That's what it is. So a bunch of curly brackets come together, and you push run, and it produces this MOF. And the MOF says, computer, you should look like this. And you hand it out to all the computers, and the computers configure themselves, and they make it happen. And the cool part, and this is 
really attracted people's attention is the computer every 15 minutes will go reread that text file and say, oh, I'll just make sure I'm still like that. Oh, but someone changed this. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll put it back. I'll remediate it automatically. That was a big deal for people. And how many, how many would like that? How many of you would like all of your servers to just always stay the way you want them, just that way, right then? And clients. And clients, sure. <laughs> sure. We'll talk about the difference there, because you really don't want that with your clients, unless you hate your users. Well, you probably do hate your users. Never mind. <laughs> um, and the, those of you who did not raise your hand, you like a lot of variability and chaos in your servers, right? Because we can achieve that, too. Um, so what Microsoft shipped for version 4 was, was pretty solid. There were some missing pieces. There were some things that became hard to control, right? Mostly because of people. What, what's the one fact we know about people? Go ahead and say it. People suck. People suck. And so you work for a company and you're responsible for a thousand servers, but there's the security team that also has to have some, some control over certain things. And, and on the SQL servers, the stupid DBAs have to have an opinion. And then, you know, on the file servers, this, this other guy has to come in and have it. So you aren't really totally in control. And that made DSC, because of the lack of any kind of top-level composition tooling, made it a little tough to work with. It meant that if, if you were the main server admin and you're the security admin, you actually have to talk to each other and like each other. Well, that's not happening. <laughs> So version 5 of, of, DS, of, well, of PowerShell, which contains the second generation of DSC, was designed on paper to start addressing some of those things, to provide some, some solutions. And kind of what I want to talk about tonight is what those are, what works, what was probably a bad idea and you might want to steer away from, and what probably still has to happen to address certain needs. But I want to point something out. How many of you think are thinking, well, I'll, I'll kind of wait till this DSC thing is kind of fully baked before I, I jump in. I don't want to be in this random period. Yeah. That will be, my, my anticipation is that they will have it fully baked and done about five minutes before the universe dies. <laughs> so it's going to be way too late to help you. The, Yeah, there's some upgrade, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of that, too, yeah. Yeah, and, and for better or for worse, we need to talk kind of about what Microsoft's attitude is around some of these things, because even if you don't agree with it, and even if it, it's not going to work for your organization, it's still helpful to know what their attitude is, like what's going through their brains. Um, sometimes a lot. Sometimes it's a little left of, you know, of where it should be. But. So here's one thing they did. Uh, in, in the original DSC, in version 4, you can create something called, and a lot of people don't know this, you can create something called a composite configuration. And a composite configuration is basically me going to the security guy and him writing a little PowerShell script that specifies the stuff he cares about on the server. And then I write the master config for the server, and I basically just reference that. I want you to do this and this and this and also whatever crap he, did, he said. And so that becomes a little self-contained unit that he can control, that he decides on. Now when we say control, can he stop me from going in and maliciously modifying it? Well, no, not really, but that's an HR problem, not a technical problem. right? If, if you're concerned that your top level trusted administrators are jerks, you should fire them, not try to prevent them from being jerks, because the one thing we know about jerks is you can't stop them from being jerks. That's why they're jerks. So he can give me this little, this little composite unit that I can consume, and that's one way that you can start to break these things down into smaller pieces. Those are basically a good idea. Composite configuration is basically a good idea. A little bit of a pain in the ass to troubleshoot, because when that thing runs, it actually produces one ginormous text file that, that the system then has to kind of unwind and process, which is great that it does it all behind the scenes if it works. But, but when it doesn't work, it is really tough to unwind. So those, from a debugging and troubleshooting standpoint, are a little, a little painful. In version 5, what they introduced to address all this is called a partial configuration. Now, the idea here is that you've got a node, right? We're going to use the word node instead of client or server, 
or whatever else, a mobile phone, I don't know. So node, you've got a node, and in most situations, you're gonna program that to go to a server to retrieve its configuration. So when you set it up or deploy the image or whatever, you tell it, here's your server, go there, here's your name, go give your name to the server, and it'll hand you your configuration, and then you, you do whatever it says, that's great. Partial configurations means you can tell every node, here's the 37 configs that you should go get. Here's one for security, here's the SQL Server stuff, here's the base server stuff, here's the I don't know whatever, go get them all. And you, the node, munge them all together to form Voltron and then run it and figure it out. Now that sounds like a fantastic idea, right? And that's basically what group policy already does. How many group policy objects can a single node be assigned? Infinite if you're patient, right? I mean, there's a processing time you pay for these things, but, but group policy kind of has a simple rule. It, it doesn't care about conflicts, right? It just is gonna grab the list and there's a certain order it processes them in, right? What's the order for group policy application? I know you know this, it was on your certification exam. Go ahead and say it. Local site, domain, OU. Local site, domain, OU. So it starts really high level and gets more specific. And the idea is it doesn't care about conflicts. If there's something defined in the local one first, well, it'll do that. If there's then something defined in the OU one later, well, it'll do that too. And it's basically the last guy in wins. It's like if every single person walked up to the front desk and placed a different lunch order for the entire team. I've got the lunch order for the entire team. Well, until she picks up the phone and calls it in, the last one she got is the lunch order she's calling in. And so that's a really simple way of dealing with conflicts. Unfortunately, under DSC, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Because it can't run these partial configurations independently. It has to merge them together and get one result that it has to run. And here's the problem with that. There are specific pieces of data that have to be unique in each little setting you specify. You need to be running this service. You need to have these files. This registry key needs to be set to that value. Every one of those tiny little chunks has to have a unique identifier of sorts. What if you give me a partial config and you give me a partial config and you accidentally use the same unique identifier, which is just a text name you name yours Fred and you think, that's Fred's a great name. You name yours Fred. What happens? It not only blows up, it can't run anything. The entire config fails. And it doesn't fail at a server where you can monitor them all centrally. It fails individually on every single node. It fails as far from you as possible and it fails in the most awkward to troubleshoot place that is possible. Partial configurations are probably, from a logistic perspective, a terrible idea in the way they're implemented now. What we probably need instead is a smarter server. Because the server where all these things sit is, is just a web server. It can also be a file server, but that's a terrible idea. It's usually a web server. What's the neat thing about web servers? You can put code on them. Did you know that you can put code on a web server, dynamic web pages? They just came out in like 1990. Well, right now, and this is gonna surprise everybody. How many of you are aware that there is a pull server as part of DSC? You've at least heard the term. Okay, jiggle your heads, good. <laughs> this thing is a feature. The way you install it is you sit down in Windows and you type add-windows feature, pull server, DSC servers, All right? It's baked into the operating system. It's a feature. You could, you could go in and check the checkbox in the server manager add remove feature role. Th you, right? you know what I'm talking about? How many of you knew that it was actually just shipped as a sample? Oh, this is the best part. Yeah, this scared the sh stuff out of me. Um, because we were up for, for PowerShell Summit and we were talking to some of them and we we're like, you know, we'd, we'd like to have the, the source code for the pull server because we want to make it smarter. And they said, yeah, we're going to do that eventually. I mean, it was, it was always just a sample anyway. <laughs> what? Well, no, I mean, it was just intended as a reference implementation. You might have mentioned that, because we've all built our empires on it. So it was just intended as a sample. 
Because we said, you know, what would be nice is if we could have these partial configs, you give me one, you give me one, you give me one, you, and the server merges them together and it explodes on the server where I can log that stuff and touch it and get to it. All, and then if it doesn't explode, the result gets handed to the client because now the client can be relatively, the node can be relatively dumb and that's what we like. We don't like smart nodes because that's logic and logic breaks. We don't like moving pieces. We like all the moving pieces to be nice and close to our hearts so we can get our hands on them. And they said, yeah, that's a great idea, but it doesn't do that. It was just a sample. Huh. Interesting. So we're kind of dealing with that. Um, they are going to eventually publish the source code for that sample so that we as a community will be able to get in. And vendors, and this is where the opportunity is, vendors will be able to go in and produce a smart DSC configuration server for you. And that is when this thing will truly take off. And if you wait for that to happen, you will be behind the curve because there's a lot of other people who are already ready to code that thing and they're going to get all the good jobs. Because you know part of this whole DSC thing is that the number of, of people who do this is vastly smaller than the number of people we currently have employed in IT. Right? If, if I can write basic text documents that tell every one of my servers how to be configured and I can do it from home, like in my jammies, and I don't ever need to show up at work because once they get the document, the servers just take care of themselves, how many more IT people do you think I need managing servers? Not damn many. We're uh, acquainted with a, a, a web software as a service company that's fairly large. I'm being very careful this time. Um, they run around 11,000 servers. 17,000 17, servers. Close your eyes and picture what 17,000 servers looks like. All right, I'm talking 17,000 boxes, okay? How many people do you think that IT team has? Two. More than two because you have to account for vacations. What's it, seven? Seven. Because seven. maybe two people take vacation at the same time. You all need to think that number through because nobody in here would guess the number that these guys have. Seven to 17,000. Completely iteratively different environments. And they're not really. They're not even fully advanced enough to be using DSC. They're pretty sure they don't need all those people. So think about that. That's why regardless of what you have felt about PowerShell or VBScript or Microsoft, once these big companies start doing that, you notice how, how it's always the big, the large companies who t tend to figure stuff out and they spend all the money figuring it out and everything else and they go through the trial and the error and then it starts filtering down and then everyone behaves like that. And even if you're thinking, yeah, I work for government though, and they'll never be efficient. And eventually they will. And it, it's gonna be a longer tail. Different companies are gonna jump into this at a different point. But when it happens, I want you to remember that you sat in this room and I told you so. Because your job is going to be this technology, not running around dealing with individual tiny one-on-one -on -one servers. You're gonna be dealing with them in bulk, and you're gonna be dealing that with them from this, this front-end policy-based type environment, and, and we're going to loop back to that a bit because it's a massively important concept and I want to try and change your brains around how you think about your servers. But before we do that, let's talk about a couple of other uh, interesting things that Microsoft did to DSC version 5, um, other than they broke it completely for a good bit. Yeah, that, uh, that happened. Um, how many of you... Uh, know about the two different protocols that you can use to talk to a web server? Just one guy. Okay, what are they? HTTP, HTTP and HTTPS. Yes. Um, you all knew that, right? Okay. All right. I don't know. Maybe pizza next time. <laughs> Urban. Yeah. Maybe. Um, so you can, a, a pull server I told you is a web server, right? So you can set it up to use HTTP or HTTPS, right? What's the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? And so help me God, do not say encryption. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding. Port 80 versus port 43. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's the functional difference? Why, why do we do HTTPS and it's not encryption? How many of you think it's encryption anyway? You can say it's okay. It's okay, you're wrong, but that's fine. It's good to be wrong sometimes, that's how you learn. Uh, the difference between HTTP and HTTPS is authentication. 
When you connect to HTTPS, Amazon.com, yes, you get encryption. But let's turn that around a little bit. Let's say you're making a phone call, and you dial the digits. Do you know who's picking up the other end of that? You can't really know, because their phone could be over there. I mean, you, th you, you think you know, but you don't know no. Now imagine the other person picks it up and says, yellow. And you go, OK, so here's the cipher we're going to use. Um, a is B, B is C, right? You, you give them the decryption code, and they go, OK. So now you can encrypt your communications, and then you give them your credit card number. It's encrypted, so nothing can go wrong, right? What did you not do? You didn't authenticate them. That's the whole point of HTTPS, is the authentication. You know it's Amazon because your browser asked for Amazon's digital ID, which is what certificates are, and the certificate or the server barfed it up, and your your client said, "Okay, this was issued by this particular you know Department of Motor Vehicles, and I trust them uh, as much as anybody. They do a good job of checking identity before they hand these things out. So you must be Amazon because you have this. Now I'll send you my credit card number. So let's turn this onto the pull server." The pull server contains a list of all your configurations. Anything the pull server hands to a node will happen. So when a node logs into a web server and says, tell me what to be, whatever that server says will happen. How do you feel about HTTP for that? <laughs> How many of you think it would be difficult to spin up a rogue pull server on your network with no one knowing? It's not that hard. And the first people who get hacked are going to be the ones who were dumb and ran an HTTP pull server. So you run it on HTTPS, and you issue it an SSL certificate from a trusted certification authority, like your internal PKI. That's fine. You don't have to pay for it. So that the server says, hey, who should I be when I grow up? But first, who are you? So that you can't have malicious configurations being spun across your environment. So that's something that's been in DSC all along. What Microsoft changed a little bit in uh, version 5 is they're now requiring a, a different type of encryption for portions of the, the configuration itself. So once that encryption flies across the wire and gets to the node, the node is now encrypting it locally on disk. Why? Because well, nothing is safe anymore. So that if somebody else goes in there and messes with that thing, if they're not able to encrypt it, then it'll break. And you'd rather have it be broken than malicious, right? So that's happening now. Uh, and then, how many things in your environment, just real quick poll, do you have a lot of things that require passwords? Yeah. Like files, do you, have, do you have to have an account to get to a file server and stuff like that? Well, all these configurations in DSC run under a system account, which has godlike powers locally and pretty much no authority off the computer, right? So if you're having a configuration go copy down packages to be installed, or go contact a database server, or go do anything basically off the local computer, it's going to have to have what? A credential. It's going to have to have a username and a password, isn't it? Didn't I mention that these configurations are plain text files? So how do we put a username and a password into a plain text file and be OK with it? Well, in the original version of DSC, you encrypted it. So you had to deploy a certificate to all your nodes, and you would encrypt just the username password. And actually, it, they make it very easy. Um, PowerShell knows how to do it. It can prompt you for the username and password, and it knows how to do the encryption given a certificate. So long as that same certificate exists on the node, so the node can decrypt it, you're good to go. Uh, for version 5, they made a slight change where the certificate that you use to encrypt credentials you know different certificates are good for different types of stuff? You know, they have like the things they're allowed to be used for. Um, do you know why that is? Ever think about that? Uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, take, take your driver's license out. Take your driver's license out. Jason made a dirty joke when I took mine out one time, and we're not going to do that anymore. Take your driver's license out. Now, I'm assuming that, where are we? Arizona? That Arizona has something, I, a lot. So 
I'm assuming they have something very similar to this that is just a photo ID, which is not a driver's license, right? And you could probably get that, you know, even if you weren't allowed to drive, so that you could go do things like buy booze, right? So think about that. You've got two different forms of ID. The one you're looking at, what are some of the uses this is good for? Buying beer. Buying beer. You can drive with it, yes. You can buy a pack of smokes with it. You can get on an airplane with it. You can vote with it. That's a really good one. How many of you have the ones with the little gold star? How many of you have gold star driver's license? None of you are flying ever again. So there's a new type called a real ID, which is going to, it, and you have to have that little gold star marker, or you won't be allowed to use it at TSA going to the airport. So you're going to have three different IDs. You'll have the gold star one, which is good for these things, and you'll have the non-gold star driver's license, which is good for a slightly smaller list. And then you'll have the non-driver's ID, which is good for a slightly smaller list. Digital certificates are exactly the same way. The actual construct of the certificate is no different. All these different IDs we're talking about are going to look almost just the same. They're going to have a picture in the right spot. They're going to have all the text that's basically the same. They're going to have basically the same information. The only difference is some of them, before they're issued to you, require a more intensive identity verification process. The real ID one requires you to show up with a genetic sample, several pieces of paperwork, and nine witnesses to your live birth. <laughs> right? So in order for an ID to be good for those uses, there has to be a lot more involved. Certificates are the same way. So for example, there's, you can put those away now unless you just want to pass them up to the front. There's a, a, a type of certificate that's good for encrypting email. All you have to do to get one of those is have it sent to your email address. That's it. Because the theory is, if you can receive it at that email address, then you must control that inbox to some degree, and so we're going to let you sign and encrypt the email coming to and from that email address. I mean, that's, that's pretty basic, right? Um, that's like saying, I want to order a new lock for my house. Great, we'll ship it to the house, because if you're there, it must be yours. To get a code signing certificate is a lot harder. They're not issued to individuals. They're only issued to companies. You have to have a Dunning Bradstreet corporate credit profile that they look up. You have to check with your secretary of state to make sure you actually exist. There's a lot more stuff because the potential for damage is much larger. Well, I am getting somewhere with this. With DSC, now, in order for a certificate to be able to encrypt and decrypt credentials, it has to have a usage called document encryption marked. And they made that change, and they didn't tell anybody. And so if you're using DSC4 and you upgrade stuff to DSC5, it'll all break. If you were using encrypted credentials, which you probably were. Uh, and do you know how to generate a certificate that has document encryption enabled? N neither does anyone else. <laughs> Jason figured it out. And you can do it with a, a Active Directory Certificate Services CA, but it's not set up to do it by default. You have to go in and hack it together to make it do it. So there's, there's, there's two parts of this, and, and one is the technical piece. And if you're waiting for me to go, but they made it all better, they haven't. That's how it is. You have to hack it together. And they're not going to because it's considered under this normal PKI knowledge. In other words, yeah, you're supposed to just know this already. Yeah. How many of you how, how many of you don't know crap about PKI? And be honest, it's okay. The camera's not pointed at you, it's pointed at me and I raised my hand. Yeah. Um, I would say before you learn anything else about IT, you need to take a class on PKI. Because if you're thinking, well, my company will never use that, it already is. You just don't know it because it's happening under the hood, because Windows is doing that garbage all the time. You just have no control over it. It's kind of like IPv6 which I know you think you shut off, but mm, it's still on. You're just not controlling it. And so when something breaks, you'll have no idea why, because you don't even know it's occurring. So you need to get yourself a class on Active Directory certificate services. You all said you had Active Directory. That means you can have ADCS, and it's free. So there's literally no financial reason not to have PKI in your organization. And if you're thinking, well, we just don't have the time to spin it up, it takes 10 minutes of planning and about six minutes of pushing a button. It's not that hard. You just need to learn what it's doing because this thing is pervasive through the entire infrastructure 
already. It already happened. Um, do you guys do a class on PKI here? See, he's nodding his head yes. They do a class on PKI. Done. So that's first, PKI. Make sure you're doing that. Here's the bigger moral, though, of, of what this version 5 update is on. Because we've talked about a couple things that, that they kind of they kind of kicked the can on a little bit, a little sideways. Um, you know, we talked about this whole document encryption thing being snuck in on everybody and, and kind of breaking all these pilot and production engagements that people had going. Uh, we talked about the partial configs and the way that works kind of being a little suboptimal if you want a, a long, happy life. So why did they do this? Well, this takes us kind of back to the original point of if you're waiting for DSC to be baked, it's never going to happen. The team is changing this thing, and I am not joking almost on a daily basis, and that is the new normal. And I will paraphrase Jeffrey Snover, if you are thinking to yourself, I did not sign up for a field where shit is changing every day, then you should look into lumber because we have not had a new tree in a long time. <laughs> IT has always been about change, and if you have managed to insulate yourself from that, or more importantly, your coworkers, because you're here, so you clearly care about your career, if your coworkers have managed to insulate themselves from change, they're going to die. They will not survive. Because all you can do at this point is ignore everything that is happening until you retire and hope to God you can last long enough. Because it is going to change every day and you're going to have to find a way to keep up for it. Now, that means, how many of you would consider yourselves to be generalists? Like you do some AD, some file servers, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, yeah. You're a little bit. Uh, and that means if you work for an organization where you know you are the IT department, you're going to want to look into outsourcing some stuff so you don't have to know about it anymore. Like I would crawl off of email as fast as possible so that I could forget everything I've ever known about Exchange. In fact, I just did that Saturday night with a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> I brain dumped the entire thing. There's something about availability groups still left, but I'm not sure if that goes equal, so I'm just leaving it alone. Why do I say what? Availability groups? No. Um, because Microsoft is never going to ship another version of Exchange. They're done. They're not going to do on-prem. They'll continue to do a certain level of support for the companies who have it right now, but they would desperately like you to knock it off. And I would say I would get off of email for the same reason that I got off generating my own power and hosting my own DNS. It's not worth the money. they are going to have it hosted. And they will either have it hosted by Office 365, if they're the type of company that can engage in that type of thing, or if they work for the federal government, they'll have it hosted by the federal government's shiny brand new private government only version of O365 that they convinced Microsoft to stand up in exchange for a bunch of money. Or they'll go to some specialty hoster that deals with their particular you know, segment of the universe, um, but it's just not worth the money to host your own email anymore. And there's too many other things. So here's the deal. This is kind of a business maxim that, that IT has never really had forced on us. Um, if you as an IT person are in charge of the care and feeding of a commodity, stop it. If what you're doing is not unique and crucial to your business, and it has to be done your business's way, and it makes you a specialist for your company, then you shouldn't be doing it. We don't generate power because it's the same. It's a commodity. We don't host DNS because it's the same. Email is the same for everybody. I get that we've got some different policies and you know you have to have your stuff stored in Ireland and you have to have your stuff stored in the Capitol building or whatever else. Those aren't differences. Those are variations on a theme and those can be met by other people who care. But we don't have the time anymore. You, you ask me, how do you keep up with all this stuff? I specialize. I don't worry about who hosts my email. I don't have time to keep up with 50 different freaking Microsoft server products, let alone all the, the Linux crap that I'm having dumped on me nowadays. I've got to pick my battles, and my battles have been the things that are unique and special to my environment, the things that are value added to my environment. And that actually creates kind of a nice segue into the next bit. How many of you have a pet? How many of you have a cow? So there's, there's this DevOps thing that DSC is a big part of. And the idea behind DevOps is real, real simple. 
How many of you remember the, the, the fuss about virtual desktop infrastructure and then how suddenly no one cared? Yeah, because there has never been a user ever walk into a business ever and say, I want a desktop. They want apps, they want applications, they want code that does things for them. This, if nothing else, taught everyone on the planet the word app. And now they get that, apps are what they want. Half the people can't even tell you what version of whatever their phone is running, but they know what apps they have. Snapchat, Angry Bird, that's it. <laughs> they care about apps. Creating an app, coding, how many of you code? How many of you know coders or have seen one at a distance? It is a uniquely human endeavor. We can create a lot of tools to make it easier for coders to be productive, but we cannot yet create a machine that creates new code by itself. This machine creates code. It is an artistic endeavor. We cannot change what coding is. So somewhere between the coder, Jason will be the coder, because that's ironic more than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Jason will be the coder, and what's your name? Tom. Will be the user. In an ideal world, they're standing right next to each other, and Jason is just beaming the code directly into Tom's brain using ESPN right? Just directly. Now that obviously can't happen, so there's going to have to be some process that gets the code from Jason to Tom, and that is usually IT operations, right? Anything we do more than nothing is a hurdle, right? We're, we're creating speed bumps along the road. DevOps is nothing more than trying to flatten these things down. And typically that takes the form of automation, because if we can push a button that says deploy app and everything else occurs as a miracle, that's a pretty flat road. That's kind of the goal that we want to get to. One of the ways we get there is by not having a lot of individualization in our environments. How many of you, and you probably work in a company like this, or you at least know of them, how many of you know of a company or work in a company where you try to keep all your client computers exactly the same? Why? Why? What's wrong with variety? It's harder to manage, yeah. Because when something goes wrong, you, you, if you've got 12 different variations, you've got to figure out, okay, is that a normal thing that's wrong with this one? Or is it, I, oh, was this the one where we kick the user? Or was this the one where we punch the user? I can never remember. So we try to reduce that variety. Well, ironically, DevOps is, is a little bit about reducing variety by automating everything so that it's always the same, the same way every time. Because the computer always does it the same way every time. It follows the rules. So that's kind of part of it. That's part of DevOps. The other part of it, and this is the unique bit, is removing uniqueness. Now you might think, well, yeah, but if everything's the same, then nothing's unique. So if we get everything to be the same, we've removed the uniqueness. Eh, not exactly. Removing uniqueness means literally nothing unique about the machine. Give me two pieces of information that's unique on every single machine you have, virtual or physical. Actually, give me three. The, the certificate for the machine itself is, is different. Yeah, maybe, but I can automate the issuing of the certificate. I don't have to know that. It's asked for something different. Yeah. Give me something else, simpler, Name, simpler. Address. Name, IP address, <coughs> MAC address. How many of you manually assign server IP addresses? God is my witness, I will never understand why. I know it's superstition. What if the DHCP server breaks? Well, then you have got much larger problems because you <laughs> engineered a DHCP server that breaks. Um, I worked for Bell Atlantic back in the day, and we did a, a huge, huge, huge migration uh, from Novell to NT, from NetWare like two point something terrible, <coughs> or three point something to, to NT4 probably at the time. Uh, and then we migrated from about 30 CC mail post offices to one exchange server. Uh, and, and it was a great time. I really enjoyed it. We had a lot of fun. You know, you run into problems and you fix them and it was very challenging and stressful and, and uh, it's where the gray hair probably comes from. And uh, at the end of it, you know, we're feeling pumped. We've, we've just killed the last CC mail post office. We just killed the last network file server. We're feeling great. We take a weekend off. We come back into work. When the boss's office, we're like, crushed it. What's next? He's like, fight the fires. Uh huh? What do you mean? We know, fix the stuff that breaks. We didn't engineer it to break. We'll go surf the internet for a little bit, but you something. So we all surfed the internet, the whole thing. Came back like a week later. 
Is there a project? No, just fight the fires. Yeah, gonna leave. So this, this whole idea of, you know, things like, like we've always just assigned server IP addresses out of an Excel spreadsheet, and I, I know some of you must, or have, or you know someone who does, uh, because we don't trust that the DHCP server will stay up. Yet, don't build those things so that they can fail, and then use them. Um, the software company is not managing 17,000 IP addresses out of an Excel spreadsheet. They're doing it with DHCP. So, the idea here, a huge idea behind DevOps, is to remove all unique knowledge. Your servers are not pets. They do not have names. They do not have IP addresses. I mean, they might. As far as I know, cows think they have names. I just don't care. And if a cow does have a name, it's never told me. And if it ever did tell me its name, I would probably get freaked out and kill it and just get a different cow that wasn't so uppity. <laughs> and that's the idea. Your servers are going to have some unique information, but you shouldn't know what it is, and you shouldn't care. So I'll give you an example. And let's take DSC as kind of an implementing technology, although there are certainly others. So this is just you know kind of a implementation example. Let's say I've got a, a bunch of new servers that are going to spin up to help run some application. They spin up. They're already going to get an IP address because something in the infrastructure will take care of that. They're going to make up a name for themselves. You know Windows does that now, right? It doesn't ask you for a name when you install Windows anymore. It just makes something up and then you can change it later. I'm not going to change it. I don't care if it has a name. Part of my DSC configuration is going to install whatever crap has to be installed. It's going to copy whatever files have to be copied. It's going to install my management agents, all my other hoo-ha. And part of that is going to go to my load balancer or DNS and register a C name for whatever application it is that server is running. I will never access it by its real name. I will access it through that abstraction layer. That server can sit there the whole time going, my name is not www. It's WN37842186B. I don't care. I'm going to call you WWW. That's all, that's all I care about. I'm going to access you through that abstraction. I don't know your name. I don't need to. And if that server breaks, and, and here's where we'll get into the realness, right? How many of you have ever deployed patches and it didn't take on one server or another? And then you had to know what server that was so you could go fix it, right? Screw it. Delete it. I don't want it anymore. Windows update comes back, or my reports, or my management tools, whatever. It says, yeah, out of the 10 servers named www, this one over here didn't take the patch. Kill it. I'm done with it. Destroy the virtual machine. Delete it. I've got a DSC script that can spin up a brand new one just like it in a few minutes. That one got uppity. It tried to be unique, and it must die. <laughs> yeah, but that one broke. We don't understand. You know, the, we, We've been troubleshooting, and there's this one that the threads get run away, and there's a memory leak. Kill it. Done. I'm over it. If it needs my attention, I just want it to die. It's just like you deal with your kids, right? <laughs> Don't piss me off. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it and make another one just like you. Only with servers, you actually can. And so that's the idea with DevOps, is we're not going to fight the problems anymore. This is what you should look like, or else. And DSC and other things are implementing technologies for that. So I, I mean, I kind of wanted to make sure that you, you knew what the grand vision was, and that is the grand vision. The grand vision is servers aren't unique. How many servers do you have running this application? I don't know. Let's go look at DNS. Uh, it says there's 10 registered with the load balancer, so there must be 10. Yeah, you know, two of them didn't take a patch. OK. Do you have a way of telling which two didn't take the patch? No, I'm just going to kill all 10 of them. They were in this together, and if they can't get along, I kill them all, and we'll start over. Which is probably not a smart question, but uh, so in this scenario where you, you're killing your cow, where is storage? Where is storage? Yeah. Storage is in the sand. So you do so, and, and I got a really good, really, really good. Yeah. Okay, good. If you want to know what DevOps should look like, look no further than Amazon. Amazon Web Services does DevOps perfectly. Now, Azure does too, but they hide how perfectly they do it. Amazon actually lets you see it. Perfect example. I can go to AWS and I can spin up a VM, right? So this is their EC2 service. And I don't have to create persistent storage. If that particular use doesn't need it, the VM spins up. Maybe it goes to a Git repo and it, it checks out code 
that's, I don't know, compiled or downloads a package. I don't know what servers do. It, it just does whatever it does. And it, for whatever it's doing, maybe it's just processing data and receiving requests, and it doesn't need local data storage of any kind. And when I turn it off, it all vanishes like it never existed. And then I spin up another one that was just like it. But you obviously have things that do require persistent storage. In AWS, that's very clearly a separate piece. You've got EC2, which is the VM, and you've got your elastic block storage, your S3, which is the storage. They're separate things. So the storage lives in a SAN. And it's just, it, it could be an expensive SAN from EMC, which is, you know, a semi-truck full of hard drives and refrigerators with a network cable plugged into one end. Or it could just be a bunch of Windows Server VMs hooked up to a machine with a crap load of solid state drives hanging off the back of it, right? Storage spaces. So storage is just a separate layer. And that's the idea is you abstract everything. How many of you have heard of software defined networking? Yep. That's because we're tired of having to go replace hardware switches. So we're just going to rack up a bazillion of them and make it up as we go along. And then nothing needs to be unique or hard to replace. This isn't working. Ah, kill it. Stand up a new one. Um, there's some, some fun numbers, and I, I don't have them all in my head. Um, you can... Oh, I know. Do you guys know I, I do a little IT ops talk show every month for Pluralsight? It just goes up on our YouTube page. Go to youtube.com slash Pluralsight. It's up there. The April episode? Let's go with the April episode. I think if you look at the April episode, um, maybe, maybe March, March or April, I reposted a keynote, the audio from a keynote that I had done for TechMentor. And there's a slide on there that talks about some really great numbers. How many of you are thinking to yourself right now, just as, as you're kind of absorbing this idea of servers are cattle, not pets? That's fantastic, Don, but it sounds like you're suggesting a situation where I have an abundant amount of room to fail epically. How many of you work in an environment that is very accepting of IT failure? <laughs> yeah. How many of you avoid failure at all costs? Yeah. Why? It's always that one that wants to rip it Why is it expensive? Recovery. Takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really the key to it. We don't change anything because change equals failure, and failure equals long recovery time, and ultimately it's the long recovery time that pisses people off, right? Everybody can survive email being down for five seconds. You'd never know. I mean, uh, oh, there it went. Right? It's when it's down for five days that people start to get vexed and, and agitated at you. So this is a speed thing. If I could destroy the mail front end server that was malfunctioning and have a new one up and running in 30 seconds, would failure be such a scary thing? No. It's all about speed. And that's what these DevOps technologies are trying to do is create speed and consistency. We know this image works. Somehow that server is different. I don't even care why. I'm just going to kill it and make another one that I know works. If you could do that super, 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 super fast, then failure wouldn't be so scary. So uh, Puppet Labs did this State of DevOps 2015, and, and that's the slide I referenced in that keynote. And it was something like once you have really gotten your infrastructure onto a DevOps style footing where you can just deploy stuff on a whim and it, it, you have, you got it down, and that's hard to get to, don't get me wrong, but once you're there, recovery times are something like 168 times faster on average. So I want you to take the last failure you had, 24 hour, what, think of a, a system server type failure that you had, how long, how long did it take to recover? Recently. Just say, make up numbers, I don't even care. Six hours, divide by 168. It's not even a number anymore. Right? And you're thinking, well, how can that possibly be true? Well, because you've got a monitoring system that realized that that thing failed, and it kicked off a runbook that spun up a new one and then killed the first one. And then it emailed you and said, I got it. Because the email took longer to get to you than it took it to do all that. That's where that automation kicks in. Uh, and in fact, those organizations tend to get something like 60 times fewer failures to begin with. 
So I want you to think about how many IT failures you had in the past year and divide by 60 and ask if your boss would be okay with that. Because most of us, it's like a sub-zero number, right? We already run pretty tight ship for the most part. But those same companies had 60 times fewer failures, 168 times faster recoveries, and more than 40 times more deployments. They had a massive amount of change going on with fewer failures because they're automating it and they're practicing consistency. And the same thing that got tested and the same thing that got piloted and the same thing that got approved is the same thing that gets deployed. And that's how you know it's going to work. So they're pushing out agility rapidly, rapid, 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 rapid change. And they're only changing one or two small things at a time. So if it breaks in test, well, you know what changed. It was only those two things. It was one of those. Fix it and then try again before you go production. But having those pipelines built, and we've got all the technology. They all exist right now. You know why more of us aren't using this right now, today, already? It's actually not a cultural thing. A lot of people think, ah, my company would never go for it. They, they would if you could prove you could do it safely and consistency, consistently. Do you know why most of us don't have those pipelines in place right now? Because you can't buy it in a box. And most of what we want to buy comes in shrink wrap, and we push a button, and we run a wizard, and it's set up, and we, we run with it. This DevOps stuff is Legos, and you have to bring your own glue, and you have to piece it together the way it's going to work for you. And the people who can do that are the ones who have completely safe jobs and who are making really good money and got a lot of paid time off. And that is where this whole industry is going to run because it's, it's already started. So you, you're in a good space because the Microsoft piece of IT is like the last one to catch up to this. And we're just right on the very beginning edge of it. So you're a good spot to start mastering some of these technologies. PowerShell is the glue in the Microsoft world. DSC is one of the major implementing pieces. And if you're thinking, yeah, I'm going to wait until they get some tooling and a nice, nice management UI and a good, good kind of wizard to set this. Yeah, it's, it's probably not happening. Um, because I know for a fact they have no plans to build one. They're going to let you build your own tools. You glue it together, they'll give you the blocks. But if you can do that, you've got an awesome career. And it's fun. I mean, the stuff, it's, when you're in a company where they do this, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is, uh, we got two tickets here. Developers got new code. Looks like it ran through test clean and everything else. So, uh, yeah, we're in the maintenance window. Three, two, one, deploy. Yeah, it's done now. Okay, I'm going home. It's amazing to watch. I mean, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world because it's what we all dream of. And they have fewer failures, faster recoveries, and massive amounts more change. So it's like everything we've always wanted and always been told we can't have. Questions? Uh, I'm kind of an example kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, so this desired state configuration, it blew my mind when you started talking. Yeah. Well, now it's a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, and Did you get your mind back together? Or well, yeah. Kinda, little, yeah. I'm like, gosh, how can we, how can you do this? Yeah. And I, and I think of, well, you know, change your going away. You're right. We were going off. We were too far yeah. Away. Once you said that, I'm like, oh, my God. But I'm just thinking file server. Yeah. And right now, exchange server. Yeah. How can you have a desired state configuration for those? Just because that's what I not primarily deal with, but I, I deal with on well, a day-to-day -day okay. basis. I'm sitting there going, no, I totally got you. Are file, there's files, there, there's file structures, there's yeah. configuration set like this. If that just goes, oh, it's acting up, boom, blow it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, where is all the data? Let, where, let's, I mean, so, the data, how? This we talked about this, the data and the server are separate, right? Well, do you, do you it's a SAN, yeah, right? Yeah, well, yeah. well, no, but you say, yeah, but that's it, right? So, so, here, let's draw a picture. Oh my God, is this a whiteboard? Okay. <laughs> Dude, no, I did that at a Microsoft office one time because they had whiteboard walls and then white wallpaper, and I got all carried away, and I, I and everyone was like, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <sighs> okay. Server runs software, right? So let's say it's Exchange. That's some of the software it's going to run. This is the SAN. This is the data. I can burn this and I still have all my data. I can't get to my data right now because I just burned my server, but the data still lives there. 
right? Are we, are we all at least in agreement that that's a thing? Okay. How many of you have mission critical services where the data is actually on the same physical box as the software? Stop it right now. That is a terrible model because you get, there's this thing with eggs and baskets and putting them all into the, 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 all the baskets in one egg or something. Don't do that. Do this, separate. So the data's here. That means I can build as many new ones of these as I want to and just point them at that data. Data is easy to make redundant, right? Sand's a big box, it's got five or six power supplies, it's got RAID you know, out the wazoo. We can make data. Big data centers like, like Google and Azure and, and, and I don't know, Yahoo still around? <laughs> um, they don't even replace failed drives. They do it like once a month on a Monday. They send an intern in to look for red lights and he just pops them in and out of a cart because they've got so much data redundancy, they don't worry about it. So, you, I mean, does that kind of at least do the high level? I could lose this all day long and so long as I could rebuild it and point it at that, I'm good to go. So, now this is an exchange server. Well. Let's say I wanted to build a brand new one of these. Let's say I, I've got Windows, just the basic naked Windows on there, and I'm using a WIM, right, a Windows image, which is serviceable, so it's already pre-patched with all the patches my company has approved. So every time I deploy a new OS, it's just there. I don't have to let it go through Windows Update 78 times. So I need to install Exchange, all right? So I would tell in my DSC document, you are an exchange server. That will trigger all the underlying magic and it will install exchange. And now I need to tell it, here's where your storage is located. It's over there, so it'll hook that up. And then whatever other configury bits about it that I need to specify. You know, you, you have this many endpoints or, I, I don't know, I've, bourbon, right? Exchange, gone. But you, you specify, instead of you physically building it, you, uh, here's a great example. Um, how many of you have a disaster recovery three ring binder? I am the last guy who had one of these. How many of you have ever been through a disaster recovery situation? How many of your IQ points do you lose immediately as soon as you find out a disaster has occurred? Yeah, at least 50, probably 75. So at the, at the very time when you need your intellect and mad skills, you're dumb. And so my disaster recovery plans included a physical three ring binder with screenshots and instructions so that my mother, literally we tested it against a guy's mother one time, could rebuild the server. Get the CD, the CD looks like this. Put the CD in the drive. Here's a photo of the drive, here's a photo. I mean, just ridiculous detail so that the cheapest intern could do it. Can you imagine building a book like that to rebuild an exchange server? Well, that's my point though. If you can imagine sitting down, I've written books and I've written a lot of courses and so it's very natural for me to think, okay, I'm gonna sit down and I need to basically document the process of installing Exchange so I can put it in a course. Here we go. And as I'm installing it over here, I'm typing about it over here. Um, I had to click the second radio button, click the second radio button, enter. And then you click next, click next, enter, right? How many of you have taken a Microsoft Official Curriculum course? How many of you have flipped to at the back. <laughs> All we're talking about is writing the lab answers. So the question is, how do you set up exchange in your environment? Write all the steps. And if you write them in the right format, DSC will do them for you. That's all it is. Because the exchange team has already invested in building the commands to do all this stuff. And so they just they, they rolled it up into a way that now, instead of you having to type, I don't know, install dash exchange server, configure dash exchange server, blah, blah, instead of you having to do that, you just type it in a relatively plain text document and PowerShell knows how to translate that into the commands that have to be run. It's, it's almost like we're letting the computers do the boring repetitive work. It's pretty much what it is which is exactly why we invented them. So they're just finally pulling their own weight. But that's why I can spin up a new server super, super fast and it'll be exactly the same every time because I just, I documented what that is. So this is all VM 
Yeah, everything's a VM. You could do it with physical servers if you still have those, but why? Yeah, why? The advantages of, of, of doing things in VMs just completely outweigh. And, and then at some point, you're going to have not major service level apps like Exchange or SQL Server, but you're going to have internal apps that run in an even lighter weight, higher density thing called a container. They don't need a whole VM. They just have this lighter wrapper around them so that you can treat an application like a VM instead of having to have a whole operating system and fake hardware and all that. That's what containers are. They're just smaller VMs. And so you, you, you know, big vision, you do this for everything. Server one, two, three failed its ping. <laughs> Hamburger tonight. <laughs> Spin up a new one. And you automate that with a response run book. How many to have monitoring software to tell you when something breaks? What's it do? Page you, email you, text you? Why? Why not just have it run a script to fix it? Well, because the answer in the past was, I have to, as a human being, get in there and troubleshoot it. I can't have a script fix it. I have to go figure out what's wrong. I bet you some of you have had response scripts that will bounce a service maybe, yeah? Because you just know that if that thing quits, you can stop the service and restart the service. Or maybe reboot a computer. You ever write one of those? Yeah? Same idea. This broke. I have to troubleshoot it. No, just kill it. The cow is sick. Shoot it. Maybe don't eat that one. Just don't have time. But can you start to see as you get toward that how, how tier two of IT goes away? All these people who specialize and, and all we need is people who can document how to install stuff and set it up. Once it's documented the first time, it's done. I don't need tier two anymore. What if you need to deploy a new one of those? I just did. And all you need tier one for is to log the tickets Oh, look, we've got this logic in place. We just logged 12 tickets against this one service. Bang. It's probably broken. Might not be. Who cares? Let's just, if your first response, right, and, and I, I got into a fun argument with this. Like, well, why would you just destroy an entire VM and rebuild it from scratch just because 12 people logged a ticket? If 12 people logged a ticket against a service within a few minutes time frame in your organization, would you not just go reboot that server to see if that helped? How often do you just go, yeah, I'll have to reboot the server, right? Mine's no different, it's just better. I don't, don't reboot it, destroy it completely and make a new one. That'll definitely have an effect. <laughs> well, you fix them. Because, so are we talking internal app or vendor app? Vendor app. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, two answers. First, IT needs to, to better guide their business to not get into those situations. And, and that's a huge actual discussion. Um, I run a, a curriculum catalog for plural sites, right? My, my job is to figure out what courses we should do. And we have people constantly coming to us. We need you to offer training on insert name of obscure product that I have never heard of and can barely even figure out how to Google, right? Well, you should not have bought that. Well, but our entire company runs on it. That was a terrible decision. So we have to do a better job. So that's, that's kind of the proactive side of it. The reactive side, often, um, if it's just poor code, whatever you're doing to mitigate it now, you automate. Right? How many, how many crap-ass websites are out there? How many of you run IIS, or at least familiar with IIS administration? Even, even? So you know how you can program IIS to automatically recycle worker processes every so many minutes? Why do you think that feature exists? Bad crappy code. code, crappy code. So same thing, you just automate it. So I, here's the one thing I wanted to ask. What's the best approach if you're a guy that's supporting developers and you have to depend on IT guys that are standing up everything to try to get them to realize that they need to start automating? What's the best approach to do something like that? Pick a small project. Okay. Pick something that's, that's going to be politically expeditious and solve that problem. Just do it. And that, you're, you're kind of asking a good question, which is how do, you, how do you conquer the cultural change? Mm -hmm. Moving to DevOps is a cultural change. 
Fact number one, not every company will be able to pull this off. Not every organization will be able to pull this off. There are plenty of government organizations in the United States who are doing this. And if any United States government organization can do this, then we none of us have an excuse not to do it, right? But culturally, not every organization is going to be able to pull it off. So there are some things, and, and I would recommend reading a book called The Phoenix Project. There's a couple of similar books. You should read that. It talks a lot about the cultural shift. There are things you can do to start small and prove to your company that it can happen, because sometimes it's just fear. And the way you get past fear is to get past, right? You have to embrace your fear and go into the tree and right the whole thing. So if that's your company, then that's how you do it. You have to confront the fear on a small scale. That's that's you know embraceable. Small, small wins, really what you're saying, right? Small wins. But if you come to a point where you just decide that your company can't change, you can't change your company, then you have to decide if you need to change your company. Because crappy companies do not deserve good IT people. And if you're a good IT person, you need to go find a good IT company. If you wake up every day and you're like, man, I wish my job didn't suck so much and that we could actually do things the smart way, you need to ask yourself why your resume is so far out of date. And you need to go get your training up to speed and you need to get your resume buffed up and you need to see what's out there. Or just, you know, stop asking the question and accept the fact that your job, it sucks. You know. It's an option. But if you can't change a company, change your job. It's an option. You know why most badly run companies get away with it? Because they know we're lazy and we hate job search. <laughs> Seriously. That's, all the smart kids go to the startups until the startup stops being fun and they don't buy more ping pong tables which is happening at Twitter right now, by the way. Apparently, that's the new predictor for the startup bubble is ping pong table sales. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then the, the smart kids leave because the smart kids can always get a job somewhere. And you're smart. We're, we're just lazy. Yeah. If you say here you just basically, uh, you go into BSD, you know how to configure it. And um, so then you can just tell it, you know, generate the IP, generate all that, and that's, that's that stuff. Service is out of the floor, I'm assuming. Build the yeah, this, this, this stuff works back to 2008 R2 to a point. Um, but 2012 and 2012 R2 and forward are, are kind of your, yeah. And you don't necessarily tell it to generate an IP. It'll do that by itself. Okay. Right? Windows comes out of the box ready to go ask for an IP address. Just let it do it. Okay, so when I add the feature on my server 2012 on this to play with it, what's my gotcha? I mean, is there anything I try to suffer? What do you mean? that I don't know. <laughs> well, everything. Um, what is it that you don't know? I you won't know until you play with it. I know that. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me suggest this. If you're, you're talking about how do I spin this up like a custom and just play with it, why are you so afraid of failure? Let it break. Let it blow up into a thousand million pieces. Who's it going to hurt? It doesn't matter what the gotchas are. Go find them. Because it doesn't matter what he teaches you or what I teach you. Do you have a kid? Do you ever tell your kids not to touch the hot pot on the stove? When they were younger? Yeah. Did they? Yeah. Why? Because we're monkeys, and until we screw it up ourselves, we don't believe it. So you're going to have to dive in and just hack your way through it, and then you will own it. But mastery over IT can't be granted. Educational materials can help you shortcut some of the experience process, but at the end of the day, until you just get in and hack through it, you're not going to know it. You won't own it. So spin it up, screw it up, ask for help. You know PowerShell.org has Q&A forms that are completely free, and you know our average response time is something like eight minutes. So I really get stuck. I thought it would take eight minutes. Ask for help. Try and fix it. Yeah. But yeah, if you get really stuck, say, look, here's where I'm at. I, I tried this. This is the error message. What the hell? And, and somebody will come back and say, have you tried this? And then you'll try that, but then you will know that. But you've got to be willing to jump in and kick it. So if you had custom apps on this, let's say you get to that control line, right? Yeah. I'm loving it. So now I get it. I get all these custom apps. 
Yeah. Uh, Custom apps. Yeah, I love them. You may have to write some code okay. to tell DSC what to do with your custom applications. But the way this thing is designed, those are very, very simple to do. Do you guys still run the tool making class here? Yeah, they run a class that teaches you how to basically do everything you need. To, coding it for DSC literally means changing one word in a script that is already working perfectly. So you can, you can code this thing up and you can run it in a test environment and, oh look, when I, I run the command, it copies the backups where they're supposed to be and everything else is working perfectly. Change one thing and DSC now knows how to operate. So yeah, for custom in-house stuff, you're gonna have to do some custom in-house code. But that's what makes us the smart kids. A ton of people. Um, Dave Wyatt, Will Anderson, Steve Murawski, um, uh, uh, Jason Helmick. <laughs> Love you, man. Uh, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work to help help people find the gotchas and understand what the pieces are. And they're they're small consumable blogs. They're small consumable pieces. I am not the type of person to go out, and I don't like to teach this way either. And if you've read my books, you'll know this. I don't like to go out and read a bunch of concepts and then try to apply them. I like to kind of, okay, I've read five pages. I think I know enough to get in trouble now. And then go nail at it for a while. And then go back and read a little bit. And then go back and play with it. Because that's how I, I own it. Me. What else? Yes. So. No. <laughs> So you've got your servers, and one of them acts up, so you burn it down. Could you send it off to like a testing area? Oh, oh, troubleshooting. Sure, if you're interested. Um, I mean, you've got a hypervisor, right? So yeah, let's say the server fails. Could you just kind of preserve that VHD off somewhere else so that you can then spin that up at your leisure and fuss with it and see what went wrong because you're interested? Obviously. And, 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 and I'm going to tell them the you, short story. Use but your words. There, there, there may be good times that, for what we refer to as, as servers that don't really care about web servers, I don't mean to troubleshoot it, just kill it and make me a new one. But there are times when you'd be in a situation where you want that kind of option. Yeah, let's, let's say you're, you're successively burning servers and rebooting them. So there's clearly some endemic problem. And you'd like to gather some evidence so that you can take it back to the developers and say, I think this. Yeah, absolutely, of course. That's one of the reasons you're not going to find this in a box, though. Because what you want to do and what you want to, you know the one thing that irritates the heck out of Jason and I is we'll be at conferences and we'll talk about this stuff. Somebody will raise their hand and say, yeah, but our company's a little different. No, you're not. You're all different. You all do things a little bit differently. And that's why you're going to have to build your own tools so that you can have what you need, not what Microsoft or someone else thinks you need. How many of you have ever gotten a tool in the box that worked exactly the way you need it to? None of you ever. So, yeah, do anything you want. Yeah, I mean, live migrate the sucker into a test environment while you're spinning up its replacement if, if that's what you want to do. I would, I personally would like just pause it so it's got a snapshot and I got the memory and everything and then I would take it and I would make like two copies of it so I could mess with one but always come back and that's the beauty of virtual machines, right? You can always come back to that one that's in that, that known state and continue messing with it. Or I, I have at least one company that I talk to, their process for this is when the thing fails, they ship a copy of the VHD off to their developers. Say, it crashed again, y'all figure it out. <laughs> well, we didn't know exactly what it looked like when it crashed. It looks just like that. <laughs> cool. All right, I'm gonna let you guys go. Um, we'll take a break now for 24 hours. <laughs> we'll come back tomorrow. Um, thanks for being here. Please, please think about these things as, as what you should be focusing on. Go home tonight and internalize some of this and wake up in the morning 
and over your coffee, when you get to work first thing, make a list of what you know you don't know. Make a list of, of everything that you think you heard me say that you're like, I have no idea what that is. That's your learning list. Go figure those things out. Those will lead to other things that you don't know. You should be learning something every single day. In fact, we're getting ready to, to launch a new marketing campaign that I, I think says exactly what everybody in our industry should be doing. What can you do today to make sure you are smarter than yesterday? And make that your list. And then pursue it. Take a class, read a blog, just start working down that checklist until you know all those things and you will never be done. And that's kind of the fun part about our industry. Or uh, lumber. <laughs> so, thanks guys. Thank you. So, um, we have this uh, facility till about eight o'clock tonight. So, feel free to stick around and trade ideas or scripts or whatever uh, that you guys need. That's what this is really about, is about getting everybody together so they can meet somebody from some other company that's doing the same thing as them, that maybe they're doing it differently, better, or has a different look on how to do something. So I'd encourage you to, to meet each other and, and uh, trade ideas and scripts. And thanks so much, uh, Don, for showing up and coming um, down here to Arizona to see us. Yeah, you guys can come to Vegas next time. Vegas. <laughs> All right.